Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Corn Baptist Church. I managed to resist saying good morning everyone just then. I mean, it's everyone is everyone that's here, but sometimes when uh, everyone's on holiday, you don't feel like saying good morning everyone to the folks that aren't on holiday, um, if something like that makes sense. We're obviously quite depleted by the start of the school holidays, aren't we? And I reckon maybe there's half as many of us, so when it comes to the songs, you need all to sing twice as loud as normal to make up for folks that aren't here, um, if that's okay. Um, thank you to Sam for standing in on the piano, or sitting in on the piano while all the other pianists go on holiday at the same time. Um, so yes, welcome to our morning service. Over the summer, uh, we're going to be a little bit more informal, not necessarily a lot more informal, but a little bit. There's no Sunday club for the children. There aren't any children here this morning anyway. There are some activity sheets um, prepared. Um, you've ha if you've had an email, you've seen what's on those. If, if you're really into word searches, you could take one away and do a word search, and it would just reinforce this morning's message. But I'm suggesting that you're probably all old enough to listen to the sermon rather than have to do a word search in the sermon um, instead. So you, if you want one of those, you can take one at the end. If any children do come in, um, then you can point them in, in the direction of the um, crayons and the activity sheets that are down there. Um, I don't think there's any notices to highlight uh, this morning. Um, you all have the opportunity to read them in the notice sheet. They're all there for you. So let's just crack on with our worship this morning. Uh, we're going to start with a couple of songs of worship, lifting up the name of Jesus um, and, uh, and being joyous, hopefully, in our worship as well. So we're going to start with Jesus is the name we honour. Thank you. 
Lord, we thank you that we can indeed say this morning that Jesus is our God. Lord Jesus, Son of God, eternal Son of God, incarnate Son of God who became man for us and bore our sins upon the cross. Jesus is our God and we will give you glory and honour. We will lift up your name because it is a worthy name, Lord. It's the name of our Saviour. It's the name of our Creator, our Redeemer, the name that we will worship now and we will worship forever. Lord Jesus, help us to lift up your name with our praises. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Let's shout for joy and sing our praises to the King or your praises to the King. might like to just uh, think of some of those words again and give thanks to God maybe for something that means something particular to you this morning. You are my creator. You are my deliverer. You are my redeemer. You are Lord. You're my healer. You're my provider. You're my shepherd and my guide. Lift up a prayer of thanks quietly to the Lord for all that he is to you, but maybe also specifically for what he is to you at this time. Lord God, we do thank you for all that you are. We thank you that you are all things to us. You are the all-sufficient one and you are our all-sufficiency. Lord, help us to trust in you, to trust in you for any particular needs that we have at this time. And help us always to be thankful for the ways that you've helped me, that you've helped us. Thank you. Do you see that again? Shout for joy and sing your praises to the King. Just one swing.
Please do sit down. Um, we're going to um, reorganise the service at this point. Um, you're going to have to wait for Mandy's all-age talk. Not later in the service, but at a later date when it comes up as a similar theme again. Um, and there are some children here. If you really, really, really are tempted by the mega blocks, then at the end of the service, we'll let you play with them a little bit. Okay? But um, we'll instead move on to the first reading, which Andrew's going to bring for us which is Matthew 7, 24 to 29. So the reading Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 29 can be found on page 972 of the <coughs> Church Bibles. So it's titled, The Wise and Foolish Builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Thank you, Andrew. It actually makes more logical sense to have that reading before this next song um, because the song is based on the reading. Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. going to carry on singing actually a, a change in um, style perhaps what a friend we have in Jesus if we're going through those storms not only can we build on his word but we also have a friend to go through the storms with what a friend we have in Jesus
please do sit down and uh, let's do as the song suggests and let's take it to the Lord in prayer as David comes to lead our prayer. Romans 8.28 is a very well-known verse. It's usually quoted as, all things work together for good for those who love God and accord, are called according to his purpose. But I recently found it could be translated as saying that God works his purposes out through those who love him. And I find that a more an encouraging way of thinking about it because it, uh, it's not passive, it involves our... God working through us and our activity, our cooperation with God. And so I thought it would be good to pray about God's plans and purposes and how we as individuals and as a church can be part of those and uh, about his plans and purposes for our country and our world. So let's pray. First of all, Lord, about your plans and purposes for us individually and as a church. This morning we're thinking about the early church in Acts and about how they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We thank you for your word, Lord, and how we can learn of your purposes in our lives by reading your word ourselves and by being taught and by the teaching that your Holy Spirit gives us and understanding that he gives. Help us to devote ourselves to understanding and to following your teaching to build our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ and to grow to be more and more like you. You want each of us to grow to be more like you and you want us to be one even as you and Jesus are one. That's what we want too, Lord. And we know that as well as teaching these things, these things depend on our deepening relationship with you through prayer. Help us to grow closer to you and more trusting in you through our time spent with you both individually and collectively in prayer. Amen. In the account in Acts, we read that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. That was your plan and purpose for the early church, and we believe that it's your plan and purpose for the worldwide church today and for Quorn Baptist Church. In our church's purpose statement, the first thing we say is that Corn Baptist Church exists to bring people to Jesus and into membership of his church family. So our main purpose and the purpose you have for us is to bring people to Jesus. So we ask you to lead us, inspire us, and to equip us to do that. Amen. We thank you for our village and for the good relationship we have together with Quorn United Church, with our community. We pray these interactions would continue to thrive and grow and continue to provide a benefit for all those involved. And we pray, Lord, also that uh, our witness to you in these relationships and activities would lead people to Jesus. Amen. We want also to pray about the new building, Lord. Thank you for the unity and commitment in this church in getting to where we are now with the building. And we thank you for the wonderful provision of the grants and the loan. And the main thing we pray is that the new building will be part of fulfilling your plans and purposes for our church and increase our opportunities to bring people to Jesus. Amen. Now we'll pray about your plans and purposes for our country and our world. We pray for the new government, for Keir Starmer, Rachel Reeves, and the rest of the cabinet and junior ministers, and for the civil servants tasked with putting their plans into action. And we pray particularly for wisdom, guidance, and integrity for Christians among those, and for their witness to those around them. We pray for wisdom and guidance in areas where, the propo where proposed and current legislation goes against your will and for support for those who honour you in trying to change it. Amen. We continue to pray for peace with justice in Ukraine, in Gaza 
and Sudan. And we pray for protection for Christians in the many countries, particularly in Africa, where their lives are endangered by Islamic jihadists. While we watch our world, we ask what the, what the psalmist asked. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. We pray for those opposed to you to repent and turn to you. But we know that ultimately the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Amen. Our second reading is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. That can be found on page 1094 of the Church Bibles. So that's Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. The passage is titled, The Fellowship of the Believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. been uh, working our way through the book of Daniel and kind of taking a chapter uh, most weeks as we've done so. Um, this morning we're taking a quarter of a verse um, as the basis of our message. Um, over the next four weeks I intend to look at those four things that the early Christians were devoted to according to this passage. Um, in the first verse of that reading they were devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We're not going to take them in order uh, because next Sunday is the third Sunday and we always celebrate communion on the third Sunday of the month in the morning. Uh, we're going to do the breaking of bread next week and uh, the fellowship the following week. But we're going to go through these four things just as um, a reminder of what church is all about really. Um, the things that the first Christians were devoted to are really the things that uh, we... Um, a couple of thousand years later, ought to also be devoted to the foundations of the Christian faith. This little passage in Acts chapter 2, um, I think it's a, it's a lovely little picture of the early church, a word picture. Um, someone described it as a vignette of the early church. Oh, that's a nice little word, isn't it? Um, what they were like and the things that they did. I think there's two important things to remember when we think about this picture of the early church. Um, because it, if we just looked at it, we could think, that's really challenging. So much is going on there, and it's so dynamic, and, and the Lord is doing so much in their midst. And we could look at ourselves and think, why is not so much happening in our midst? And these two things maybe point to something of that. The first thing to say is that a lot of these people are new converts. We don't know exactly how long it was between the day of Pentecost that's described in the, 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 the major part of Acts chapter 2. Um, the Holy Spirit came down in power for the first time upon the apostles and a group of about 120 Christians. 
Peter stood up and he preached a message. And uh, uh, just before our reading, it said about 3,000 were added to their number that day. We don't know how long from verse 41 to 42, but a lot of these folks are brand new Christians and they're full of the enthusiasm of their new faith and they're living it out enthusiastically. Turn to Revelations, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation contain seven letters to different churches with uh, different um, commendations and different criticisms of those seven churches. And uh, we can read of the church in Ephesus in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Yet this I hold against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So here a letter is being written to a mature church, a church that's been around for a number of years. The Apostle Paul had spent quite considerable time in the church in Ephesus. They'd been well-founded and well-taught. But now at this time when John is writing the book of Revelation. They've lost their edge. They've lost their enthusiasm. They've lost their first love. It's a bit drier, a bit more formal. And maybe that's a challenge to us. Have we got that enthusiasm of new converts? That first love for the Lord Jesus? Or have we lost it? Do we need to renew it? Do we need to turn back to the Lord? in repentance that we've grown cold in our faith and renew that enthusiasm for him and the work that he has for us. So that's the first thing to remember about these people described in Acts 2, 42 to 47. They were full of enthusiasm as new converts. The second thing, of course, is that this is just after the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came down in power upon the church. And in Peter's sermon, he said, this is a gift for all of you, for everyone, it's available to all. Repent and believe, and the gift of the Holy Spirit will be given to you as well. So not only are they full of the enthusiasm of new faith in Christ, but they also full of the power of the Holy Spirit so when we look at what the early church was doing, it's not all about human effort. I must try harder, I must try harder. It's about asking the Lord to fill us with the strength of his Holy Spirit, to mature in us the fruit of the Spirit, so that we're equipped for Christian fellowship and Christian service. So the foundation of this picture of the early church is conversion, new faith, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's turn our attention more specifically, and over the four weeks, of course, we'll cover different aspects. But let's turn our attention now to that first part. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, my first point is that it wasn't the apostles' teaching. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It wasn't the apostles' teaching, okay? They didn't create it. The apostles didn't make up this Christian teaching to share with the church. They were passing on what they had received. Jesus came preaching, preaching about the kingdom of God. He didn't just come to die on the cross as saviour. He came also as a teacher and a healer. Let's look at a few of those verses. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. After John, that's John the Baptist, was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And through the Gospels, we build up a picture of Jesus' teaching. We remember that it says that he went from town to town and village to village, teaching. He may have repeated the same kind of things in different villages because it was appropriate 
for everyone. Not, it wasn't a different teaching for Capernaum and for uh, Nazareth. It would have been the same teaching shared, maybe with different variations, and that may be one of the reasons why the Gospel accounts show some variations in the recording of Jesus' teaching. Because if you're an itinerant preacher, you say the same kind of things, but slightly differently in different places where you go. But Jesus went around teaching, and particularly teaching about the kingdom of God, the rule of God, and think that's the things you need to do if you're obeying the king. Repent and believe the good news. Mark 6, verse 6. This is the first bit. Oh, this is what I've already said, this bit. Then Jesus went round teaching from village to village. There you go. Um, and uh, Matthew, the end of Matthew's gospel, what we know as the Great Commission, Jesus says to his disciples, to, to we can call them apostles, it was the main leaders, the ones he'd sent out before, and now he's sending them out as he goes back to heaven. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. There's the basis of the apostles' teaching. It's the teaching of Jesus. The things that Jesus commanded them are to be passed on. But just one more thing to say in this section. Um, Matthew, sorry, not Matthew, Luke, now 24 and 27. John instead of Luke. Luke 20, 24, 27. The, uh, two disciples on the road to Emmaus after Jesus had risen. And Jesus comes alongside them. And it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the, all the scriptures concerning himself what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I just wanted to include this to remind us, as if we needed reminding, that Jesus' teaching isn't brand new teaching either. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament. So the truths are there in the Old Testament leading up to the time of Jesus. Jesus reinforces that. He explains it to his disciples, how this applies um, to him, not just to temple worship, and guides them to understand the Old Testament. So Jesus' teaching applies the Old Testament. The Apostles' teaching is a repetition of Jesus' teaching as he guided them thoroughly throughout those years together with him and then very particularly after the resurrection when they could see things through a slightly different lens because seeing things after the resurrection brought all that teaching into a brighter light than leading up to the crucifixion. So it was not the apostles' teaching, it's the message of the Bible, it's Jesus' teaching. And of course, that's why we have the reading from Matthew. As Jesus said, if you listen to my words and put them into practice, that's like building on a rock. But if you ignore them, it's like building on sand. So are we devoted to the teaching of the Word of God, to Jesus' teaching? the things that the apostles taught. So it was, as well as not being the apostles' teaching, it was the apostles' teaching. They had authority to preach. They were sent by Jesus. That the Great Commission sent them out. The first apostles had authority in a very special sense. They were witnesses to the resurrection. And that's made them particularly um, authorised in the early part of the church to proclaim the teachings of Jesus. And the teachings were then recorded for us in the New Testament, writings of either apostles or of close associates of the apostles. And these things are written down for us so that we can read them today. So in a special sense... The apostles were important teachers in the church. They were the ones with the authority to teach. But there's a continuing sense as well because God continues to gift people 
as teachers of the word of God, as teachers in the church. We look in Romans chapter 12. We're quite eclectic this morning, um, but I hope uh, if, you, if you want to follow uh, through in the different passages, then do flick through. Um, if not, the references are in the notes. Um, this is just a, an A4 version of the A5 sermon notes, so you can check the references afterwards if you want to. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. Isn't it a relief that God's made us different? Imagine what it'd be like if we're all the same, if we're all good at just one thing and no one was good at anything else. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it's serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. God continues to gift teachers to the church. And so there is a sense within church life where you would look to particular teachers of the word of God to grow by. But there does need to be a word of caution because there are false teachers as well as true teachers. There are warnings in the New Testament about that. Just consider one of those, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather round them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. People will turn aside from sound doctrine and the teachers they'll listen to will be the ones who are not teaching sound doctrine. Really, there's quite a strong warning in our day and age because if you're on the internet, which I think most of you probably are, not or maybe, but if you're on the internet, you can access so many different so-called Christian teachers, and some of them are teaching sound doctrine, and some of them aren't. And if you like what some of them say, are you checking that it's sound doctrine, or are you just leaning towards them? Oh, that's nice. And some are very full of speculation. Teachers... Christian teachers have a responsibility before God to teach and they'll be judged by God according to that. But it doesn't mean that there's no individual responsibility either. So you as listeners, you do have some responsibility as well, not just to drink everything down that the preacher says. Um, If anything seems slightly, oh, not quite sure about that, then you can check it up for yourself. Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says that a a group of people in Berea, when they heard Paul preach, they went and they checked the scriptures for themselves just to make sure. Is it confirmed by my own looking at the scriptures? And of course all of us have access to the word of God. We should be reading it and uh, learning from it in our own private times as well as when we gather uh, together and listen um, hopefully to Christian teachers. Um, So it was not the apostles teaching but it was the apostles teaching that they were devoted to. They didn't just think oh I'm all right I'll be able to learn just for myself but they were part of the church that was learning together being ministered to by those that God had given to them as teachers. Okay, what was uh, in the apostles' teaching? First of all, it's a gospel message. It's a gospel message. It's good news. It's about uh, faith and conversion. The book of Acts, of course, um, particularly its purpose in the Bible, is to record the early preaching and the expansion of the church. So the book of Acts majors more on the evangelistic teaching of the apostles, what they said in order to persuade people to trust in Jesus the Saviour. The book of Acts doesn't so much 
go into the ethical teaching. It's the foundation of the gospel. But then the rest of the New Testament unpacks the ethical teaching that Jesus has given and applies it for church life, building on the Old Testament and the teaching of Jesus through into the New Testament letters with the things that we should do. But that teaching, of course, of what we should do as Christians is only meaningful in the light of the good news of the gospel. It's meaningful in the light of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's meaningful in the light of faith in Jesus and repentance from our sins to trust in God as Saviour. The good news, the gospel, is the, uh, the foundation, isn't it, of... Um, of the Christian teaching. It's so important to get a grasp of that because it leads to the rest. If, if we just had the ethical teaching, you'd be thinking that you've got to earn your own salvation, that you've got to obey all this ethical teaching which seems so difficult to achieve because none of us is perfect. But the good news of the gospel is that though we fall short, Jesus has died for our sins. And we can be forgiven and with the gift of the Holy Spirit, we can walk with God to do the things that he calls us to do. Have you trusted in Jesus as your saviour this morning? The foundation then is that it's a gospel message, but the apostles' teaching was more than a gospel message. It's a message of a changed life, a new way to live life. Repentance and faith are both meaningless if they're not backed up by actions. John the Baptist said that about repentance in the brief bit of his ministry that's recorded in scriptures. Luke chapter 3 and verse 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with with repentance. Repentance wasn't, isn't just saying sorry to God for the wrong things we've done and then getting on with life. Repentance is the start of a change, a change of heart and mind. Yes, sorry to God, but also determining to walk in God's ways, not in our own ways any longer. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And you want to read some of the things that um, John the Baptist suggested as fruit of repentance, you can read a bit further in Luke chapter 3. But faith also is something that's not just an ethereal thing in our heads, but also leads to actions. And James is best known for this. James chapter 2 and verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. The great reformer of the Christian faith, Martin Luther, in the 1500s, didn't like the book of James because he felt that it lent a bit too much towards works, deeds, but that's not what James is saying. He's saying that if you have got faith, it will be shown in deeds. Because faith should always lead to deeds. This is why, uh, as Paul writes to the Romans, the start of chapter 12, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies to God as living sacrifices. In view of God's mercy, it starts with the mercy of God, with salvation, with understanding that we're forgiven by God's grace. But it goes on, offering our bodies to God as living sacrifices. Obedience to the ethical teaching of God's word is a response to salvation, not a means for salvation. But if we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, 
and will be devoted to living out that teaching in our lives. It should be challenging us to change things in order to walk more closely in the purposes of God. So are you devoted to the Apostles' teaching this morning? Going back to Matthew chapter 7, are you building on the rock the words that Jesus gave that are a solid foundation to build our lives upon? Are you building on them? Or another picture from James' letter. He talks about the word of God is like a mirror When you look into the word of God, it shows you something about yourself. And if you turn away and you forget to comb your hair that you saw was out of place, then what's the point of the mirror? Are you brushing your hair after you look in the mirror? Is the word of God challenging you and changing you? Because if you're devoted to the apostles' teaching, then there will be challenges and changes in our lives according to it. They were devoted to the Apostles' teaching. Amen. We're going to finish with a couple more worship songs. And the first one is one in which we respond to uh, our salvation. We respond to the King of Kings, who is also the strong deliverer. He's the one who uh, ransomed our souls, who brought these sinners near to his throne. We respond by saying that we bow before his throne and we live to serve his majesty. It's a song of response to Jesus.
Lord, we do thank you indeed for those royal robes that we don't deserve, that when we trust in you, you clothe us in robes of righteousness to cover over our sin so that we might be uh, righteous to be in your presence, so we might enter into the holy place because of Jesus. Lord, because of that, because of your grace, your mercy towards us, Lord, we want to offer ourselves to serve your majesty, to serve you, to be about your kingdom purposes in our midst, whether that's on our streets, amongst our neighbours, in our families, whether it's serving a particular work of the local church or some other area, Lord, that you call us to. Lord, may we be about your kingdom purposes. May we be proclaiming the good news of Jesus, the gospel message. And may we ourselves, Lord, be continuing to learn from your word, growing in our faith, growing in maturity, walking more and more closely in your ways. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, we do thank you that we can uh, know the truths that the songwriters put into this, that we have something sure and certain even in the midst of a storm. Sure and certain in this life to go through day by day, but also that eternal certain hope to one day stand faultless before the throne because of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to trust in you and to build our lives upon this cornerstone. 